Impending death. Death can be ontologically characterized as the own most non-relational and inevitable possibility. It is an omnipresent, inescapable, but non-actualizable possibility of our being. Thus, it is an ungraspable but undeniable aspect of every moment of our existence. It follows that we can only relate to death in and through its relation to what is graspable in our existence, namely, the genuine existential possibilities that constitute our daily life. Graspable here means ready to hand. Ungraspable means it's present to hand. This is terminology developed by Heidegger to talk about ontological characteristics. In other words, death is graspable only as a possibility, never as an actuality, because by the time death occurs, we're no longer here to experience it. Death can help us choose the authentic possibilities in our existence, because after all, if one is faced with impending death, things acquire a different values. They appear more immediate, more urgent than they ordinarily would. And so we can relate to death through other possibilities that are similarly unique to us and therefore our own. Death thus remains beyond any direct existential or phenomenological grasp, but it is graspable indirectly as an omnipresent condition of every moment of our directly graspable existence. Death is not a specific feature of the existential landscape, but a light or shadow emanating evenly and implacably from every such feature. It is the context within which the existential features configure themselves, a self-concealing condition for our capacity to authentically disclose our own existence to ourselves. Death is also graspable as a condition. In other words, we can imagine it as the absence of life or existence. It's called self-concealing because it's non-existential. It's the absence of something, not the presence of something, the absence of life. The presence of death, even as an impending event, increases the significance of every choice we make. In other words, it gives more meaning to our lives because of its presence. If we take death as a context, it adds meaning and distinguishes authentic being in our existence. Just as death is a phenomenon of life, it shows up only in and through life, in and through that which it threatens to render impossible, as the possible impossibility of life. Phenomenologically speaking, then, life is death's representative, its proxy. We can overcome death's resistance to our grasp in and through its acknowledgement. Death can be made manifest in our existential analysis by recounting that analysis in the light of the possible impossibility of that which it analyzes. Putting it the other way, our being towards death is essentially a matter of our being towards life, of relating or failing to relate to our being in the world as utterly primordially temporal. In this way, our life can be experienced as a proxy for death. If we can't experience death directly, we can experience it through the impact that it has on our life. Failing to relate to death, repressing it, or going into denial about it, effectively means that we're hiding it with idle talk. Death can become a measure of the quality of our life and our choices in relation to its possible impossibility. It helps us choose what really matters. If you think about how long the world has existed before our birth and how long it's going to be around after our death, our existence is finite and limited compared to the period of our non-existence. 
What does this look like? For us to confront life as fully our own possibility is for us to acknowledge that there is no moment of our life in which our existence is not at issue. This discloses that our existence matters to us. And what matters about our existence is the totality of our life. We thereby come to see that we are responsible for our life, that our life is our own to live or to disown. Death's existence makes a claim on our life that is essentially non-relational, that cannot be blamed on the other. This means our existence is at issue at every moment. Any moment death can come, and we don't know when it's going to happen, but that it is a certainty. The real issue here is the quality of the totality of our life, the quality of the choices we make, and the values that we maintain. The awareness of death's inevitability reduces our fear of external threats, such as the threat of authority, the threat of public opinion, and so on. Death is not something external to us. It's a quality of our own being. And it helps us take ownership of our lives and be at cause over the quality of our existence. To think of our life as fated to be rendered void by death is to acknowledge the sheer contingency of its continuation. The hardest lesson of our mortality is its demand that we recognize the complete superfluity of our existence. Our birth was unnecessary. The course of our life could have been otherwise. Its continuation from moment to moment is no more than a fact, and it certainly will come to an end at some point. After all, if our life is contingent, then we can be any way we want. We're not limited to any certain way of being. It doesn't really matter anyway. And very importantly, if our life is contingent, we're not stuck with the way we wound up being, how we were shaped by the accidents of life. We can create our own way of being. The point is, if our being is shaped by more or less random external factors, then it's mutable, and we can choose to shape it by our own choices. Authentic Being Toward Death to acknowledge this about our lives is simply to acknowledge our finitude, that our existence has conditions or limits. It is not self-originating, self-grounding, nor self-sufficient. It is contingent from top to bottom. But no representation of ourselves is harder to achieve or enact than this one. Nothing is more challenging than to live in such a way that one does not treat what is in reality merely possible actual or conditionally necessary as if it were absolutely necessary. Authentic being towards death is thus a matter of stripping out false necessities, of becoming properly attuned to the authentic modalities of our existence. So our being is not original or fixed, and it's certainly not eternal, and our choices are not absolute or predetermined. What's in the astrology this morning has nothing to do with what you actually do today. The point is, our potential for self-determinism is much greater than traditional philosophy allows. Traditional philosophy wants to make rules for us to follow, but we actually have much greater freedom. The false necessities of the other distract us from awareness of our real being, including even death. We get so caught up in what other people think and what other people want that we forget what we want and what we really need. This last perception most clearly connects representing our being to ourselves as a whole and including the possibility of our authenticity in our human everydayness. For an authentic grasp of our existence as mortal inflects our attitude to the choices we must make in four interrelated ways. 
We are beings whose existence is contingent. We might not have existed at all, and our present modes of life are no more than the result of past choices, whose non-existence is an omnipresent possibility, so that each of our choices might be our last. With a life to lead, our individual choices contribute to, and so exist in the context of, the whole of the life of which they are a part, and whose life is our own to lead, so that our choices should be our own, rather than those of the other. So, despite the disadvantages of the existential human condition, it is possible to be authentic in everyday life. Awareness of impending death highlights the contingency, possible impossibility, wholeness, and our own ownership of our life. It also highlights our fortuity, temporality, integrity, and that we are at cause over our own being. In this way, awareness of death actually increases our possibility for being authentic in ordinary life. In short, an authentic confrontation with death reveals us as related to our own being so as to hold open the possibility and impose the responsibility of living a life that is genuinely individual and genuinely whole, a life of integrity, an authentic life. But we typically don't relate authentically to our death. Instead, we flee from it. We hold death as something that happens to others, to whom we relate as mere impersonal tokens. We encourage dying friends and relatives by asserting that it will never happen. When it does, usually hidden behind the closed doors of an institution, we often consider it a social inconvenience or a threat to our tranquilized avoidance of death. Although we may not actually deny that it will happen to us, we take actions to hold it off fitness schemes, cryogenics. We regard death as distant, as something that will happen, but not now, and hence as an impending event rather than as the omnipresent possibility of our own non-existence, that impossible but unavoidable possibility without which our existence would lack its distinctive finitude. We're in denial about many things concerning death, especially that death can be a choice. One can choose the time and manner of one's death. Instead, we try to hold it off as long as possible with heroic medical interventions and running away, going, putting our head in the sand and trying to make believe that death doesn't exist, but it does exist and it's going to get us anyway. Hiding death or hiding from death is not a good solution because it fragments us. It alienates the part of us that is the most our own. The thing that death shows up is that we are responsible for our being, nobody else and nothing else. Shrinking from death makes us incapable of confronting oppression because all an oppressor has to do is threaten us with death and we cave in. Where is our nobility? Where is our courage? Courage comes from being ready to face death at any moment. This tranquilized alienation is characteristic of our average, everyday, inauthentic existence. It suggests entanglement in a misplaced sense of the necessities of finite life. Part of our everyday inauthentic mode of being is that we regard the existential possibilities open to us and the choices we make between them as fixed by forces greater than or external to ourselves. We do what we do because everyone does. We displace our freedom outside ourselves, existing in self-imposed servitude to the other. We are unwilling not only to alter that fact, but even to acknowledge it. The reality is that we alone are responsible for allowing ourselves to be lost 
in the range of possibilities that our circumstances have thrust upon us, and we alone are capable of and responsible for changing that state of affairs. By avoiding death, one of the consequences is that we give up our ability to create new possibilities, because to create new possibilities, first we have to be willing to die to the old possibilities. Avoiding death also shifts our focus from being to knowing, thinking, feeling, doing, and having in the context of being in the world. And this is disempowering. Our life is not our own. Our values are set by some external forces. Our condition of being alone and lost in the world makes us feel like we're not responsible. But in fact, we alone are responsible both for being lost and for finding our authentic being. That's really the way it is. Authentic being towards death is a mode of anxiously resolute anticipation. It is anticipatory because death, the impossible possibility, can only be anticipated. It is anxious because living in awareness of our mortality means to make choices in the light of an extreme and constant threat that emerges unwanted and unbidden from one's own being. And when we say anxiously resolute anticipation, resolute in that context means ready to experience anxiety in order to attain integrity. Being resolute toward death gives us the ability to stand for our own choices, because after all, we're going to die anyway, so we might as well be real and have integrity standing before impending death. And death is ours. Our death is born along with our birth. It is a quality of our own being, and it is the one thing that no one can take from us. Authentic being means to choose for oneself in the face of the possible impossibility of the end of our own existence. Our natural state is to be anxious because we are oppressed by being in the world. Death, as an ungraspable possibility, reinforces the fit between itself and the essential objectlessness of anxiety. No object-oriented state of mind could correspond to an existential phenomenon that utterly resists objective actualization within our worldly existence. To state it the other way around, apprehending our worldliness as essentially uncanny, as a mood of being away from home, is to apprehend the mortality of our existence. Authenticity in this context means to choose for ourselves in the face of death, knowing its inevitability and making our life our own. Death and anxiety are similarly non-objective. In other words, they don't have a victim, they don't have an object. Therefore, they are similar in quality. That's why both death and anxiety give us a handle on our being. They make it easier for us to measure whether we're being authentic. The feeling of uncanniness, of being not at home in the world, is similar to objectless anxiety in the face of impending death. That's why skepticism and anxiety are actually useful for us. The internal relation between ourselves and nothingness binds our analysis of death together with the analyses of guilt, conscience, and temporality in the succeeding parts of this series. Death is essentially implicit in the ontological structure of care, as well as in the anxious mood that reveals that structure. But it lies beyond direct phenomenological representation. It follows that to acknowledge death philosophically is to question our sense that the ontological structure of care gives us a grasp of our being as a whole, as well as whether such a grasp is even possible. 
Guilt and conscience will be covered in the next series, which is called Call of the Friend. One of the attributes of the attitude of care for the world is being ahead of ourselves, looking into the future, anticipating the arrival of impending death. Care without a sense of impending death would only be care about the other, and that's very limiting. The question is, does death mean that we can never grasp our being as a whole? Because by the time our life is complete, we're no longer here to grasp its meaning. We can attain a proper phenomenological grasp of death only by conceding the impossibility of ever doing so. We cannot understand our being without understanding that it is internally related to something beyond phenomenological representation. We thereby invoke a broader context for the whole of our existential analysis, the requirement to relate every element of it to death, which is neither a phenomenon, nor which, phenomenologically speaking, can appear as a phenomenon or as the object of a possible discursive act. For nothingness is neither representable nor unrepresentable, hence it can be represented only as transcendental, beyond the horizon of the representable, its self-concealing and self-disrupting condition. So here is a paradox. Death is the completion of our life. And to understand our life, we have to see it as a complete unit. Yet, death takes us away so we can never really see the completion of our life. Therefore, death is beyond phenomenological representation. It's something transcendental to all symbology. After all, what can be said or represented about non-existence, about emptiness, about nothingness? We can't even say that death or non-existence exists because it's not a being. It's the absence of a being. This is a very deep problem which is dealt with fully only in the teaching of the Buddha. As far as philosophy is concerned, death is a self-concealing and self-disrupting condition. It's a limitation, not a limit. In other words, there's no reason why we can't continue to be something beyond death, but whatever it is, it's not what we are now. Since this horizon is the nothing, then to invoke it as a broader context for the analysis of our being, in one sense, adds nothing whatever to that analysis, for it provides no specific analytical ingredient in addition to the ontological structure of care. Nothing in the analysis of death implies that our characterization of care is incomplete. In another sense, however, Introducing this relation to the nothing as internal to our being means introducing the thought that every element in the articulation of care is related to the nothing, and so must be reconsidered in its uncanny light. Thus, introducing this unthematizable theme of nothingness alters nothing and everything in our existential analysis. Here's the major clue. Non-existence is not a thing. It's a context. It's a space in which we hold our life. Death adds meaning, not substance, to our being, because even though it's a nothing, it gives our being more meaning in the presence of its possible absence. Therefore, holding our existence in the context of non-existence, is authentic. And that's why awareness of death leads to authentic being. If the nothing really is the self-concealing and self-disrupting condition of our comprehending and questioning relation to being, then phenomenological analysis can only allow it to appear as it is by allowing the nothing first to conceal itself 
and then to disrupt its concealment in the phenomenological analysis itself by appearing within the analysis as that upon discovering which the whole analysis is turned inside out. Only in this way could an existential analytic of our being achieve the completeness that its condition allows and its object discloses by presenting itself as essentially incomplete, beyond completion, as capable of being completed only by that which lies beyond it. Thus, our being is revealed as essentially enigmatic and paradoxical. We cannot conceive of ourselves as non-existent. Our non-being is literally inconceivable. Non-existence conceals and disrupts both itself and our self. In other words, non-existence is a self-disruptive condition, such as death, such as non-being. Non-existence as a context changes the whole meaning of care, which is the basis of our being in the world. Our being reveals its true meaning only in the context of non-being. And that is the real meaning of the Buddha's teaching of emptiness. And we'll cover that completely in a future series. But right now you need to understand that being requires non-being or non-existence to get its complete meaning. Our analysis of death thus shows that the earlier analysis of being in the world, while lacking nothing, is essentially incomplete and beyond completion. This rejects the idea that essentially finite human understanding is always capable of further and deeper spirals of articulation. Rather, it suggests that there is something essentially beyond representation in the being whose being is structured by care. Hence, something about us that is beyond the grasp of any conceivable supplementation or deepening of phenomenological analysis. The ontological characterization of care lacks nothing to describe our being in the world, but it is still incomplete because it has not included the concept of emptiness or nothingness. No logical analysis can fully express the paradoxical nature of being. Being that includes non-being in its nature is essentially enigmatic. So the Buddha's characterization of being as being both being and non-being, as well as the existential characteristic of it being both life and death, is essentially enigmatic and paradoxical. This non-existence sets a limit to phenomenological analysis, but even though it doesn't really fit, it has to be included to have the complete picture. The function of this analysis of death is thus to disrupt the apparent completeness of the concept of care, thereby allowing our ontological analysis to represent the self-concealing and self-disrupting condition of our being and of its relation to being itself. The peculiar way in which this analysis of death alters nothing and yet everything in our analysis successfully represents our essentially enigmatic relation to the nothing that is death. Look up disrupting. It's a very interesting term. Check out the word roots and what they mean, what they imply. Now, non-existence is self-concealing because it doesn't exist. You can't perceive it directly, only by the absence of something. Non-existence is self-disrupting because it shows up functionally as a limitation of our phenomenological analysis. Therefore, it is self-revealing. Therefore, our ontological analysis represents non-representational non-existence as the possibility of the absence of being. 
the possible impossibility of death. Analysis of death reveals that even non-existence can show up in our space. We can be conscious of it. And that is the essence of enlightenment. Exercises and Questions Consider your everyday attitude toward death. How do you keep yourself from encountering it authentically? Consider your human life of a hundred years or so. Now consider it in the context of the lifetime of the universe. What is its significance? Consider your life as a whole. What is your consciously chosen purpose for existence? Do you have one? Recall some of the influential circumstances of your life. What if they were different? How would that have changed the way you wound up being? If you could choose to be different than the way you wound up being, what or how would you be? Consider how your being has changed over time. How are you different now from the way you were? Were the changes in your way of being in the question above shaped by externals, or were they your own choice? Did you blame others for your own choices? Can you conceive of a situation in which you would choose to die, not by suicide? Would you risk your life for something greater than yourself? What would it be? Consider that changing your being requires your old being to die. Could you be responsible for that? Get clear that standing for your own choices means being ready to face impending death. Are you prepared to do that? Consider that caring only about the world makes us forget about death because the world never dies. What shows up for you? Consider death as a condition, limitation of our existence. How can death be a limitation and not a limit? In considering death, how does non-existence show up in your clearing?